Welcome to the Opportunity Zones and Private Equity Show. I'm Jimmy Atkinson. High net worth investors who invest passively into different private placement offerings face numerous challenges. And joining me today is fellow investor and entrepreneur, Litan Yahav, CEO of Visor. And Litan joins us today from Natanya, Israel, just outside Tel Aviv. Litan, welcome and thanks for joining me on the show today. How are you doing? Great. I'm super excited to be on the show with you, Jimmy. I love what you guys excited to have you here, Litan. Um, I don't always have uh, fellow limited partner investors on the show. I'm usually speaking with uh, accountants or attorneys or fund managers, deal sponsors, uh, folks who are either providing services to the industry or raising capital for their deals. So it's, it's good to have a fellow investor on the show. Um, we're going to talk a lot about y- your company, Visor, toward the end of the show today, but I want to talk with you about um, just your journey as an LP throughout the course of the episode before we really dive into to the meat of what Visor does. But uh, let, let's touch on Visor first here real quickly. For our audience of high net worth investors who may not be familiar with Visor yet, can you give us a brief introduction to Visor and what your role is there? Yeah, well, Visor sort of sprouted out of our own issues managing these passive investments that we've been doing for the past eight years. Um, and it's essentially a platform to manage wealth for people that have more complexity, that have those types of investments. So that's like in a nutshell. But I mean, I love to dive into the story behind like LP investing and passive investing, and then maybe you'll they'll be better, easier understood understood exactly what Visor is about. Yeah. So we'll we'll get there. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about Visor uh, later in the episode. I guess we kind of have to set up why you create it right. and what services it provides to folks like us, limited partner investors, and a lot of the audience listening today. As well as you know, as I mentioned, you are a high net worth investor. You're a passive limited partner or LP investor in a number of real estate and private equity deals. Uh, I'm I'm curious, how did you get your start as an investor? So I'm a tech founder and founded a startup like 11 years ago uh, with my current co-founder in a very crazy, weird, probably whole episode just to talk about that. But it was in the diamond industry. And we did 3D imagery for diamonds. Anyway, we sold that back in 2015, uh, made some money and decided to manage it on our own. And in Israel, which is where I live, uh, every second person invests passively in real estate abroad in the US and Europe. And so everyone knows it, knows a guy. Uh, and so we started to invest our money on our own, uh, investing at the beginning in a few single family rental properties. And then with some op- sponsor operators we, we know from Israel who do real estate syndications in the U.S. Uh, and that was basically the beginning of the journey of, of investing that started eight years ago uh, and sort of gave us that understanding, me and my co-founder, that we want to be as passive as possible when it comes to investing. Uh, and that means you have to find really good people to invest with that you can be passive. But that's sort of like the, the, the gist of how we started and so you had this windfall um, and you, you started accruing some wealth and then you had the opportunity to invest passively in a number of, of real estate deals. Prior to that, or maybe maybe even now as, as well, are, are you doing any investing into any traditional types of investments, uh, stocks, bonds through a brokerage account? I'm just curious if you've just always been uh, what, my, what I might refer to as an alternatives investor. So I'm, I'm a tech founder and that comes together with risk, right? And yeah. so I am not what you'd call a uh, risk averse, I'm mm-hmm. a risk taker. And so, but with that said, I think that investing in alternatives isn't as risky as what a lot of people do in the stock markets. That's my approach. So I've never um, sort of been drawn to stock picking or being or dealing with uh, public investments other than just buying an index fund and just forgetting about it because so sort of I had this understanding pretty early on that if it's not my job or my profession, I'm probably never going to beat the market and most people don't. And so why even spend time trying to? So I just invest in an index fund and take my risks to leverage to create more wealth in the alternative space. So no, I think that's a great strategy. It's uh, similar to my approach as well. I've been uh a stock market and bond market investor uh, for, I guess, most of my, all of my adult life, pretty much, but I don't pick stocks either. I, I like to invest passively in some low cost 
index mutual funds and ETFs and, and a handful of, uh, I think I guess I got a handful of uh, stocks and an older portfolio of mine, but the vast majority of uh, my liquid wealth in that's in traditional public markets is just in low cost uh, index funds. I think that's a, a good way to go unless, as you point out, it's going to be your full-time job. And even those folks who devote their uh, a lot of their time and attention to trying to pick the right stocks oftentimes have a hard time beating the market. So uh, yeah, it's interesting how you decide to allocate your risk differently. You, 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 you're you you more one who wants to put the take the risk out of the public markets, put it into alternatives instead. Um, so when you, one thing you p- uh, pointed out uh, in one of your previous answers is that you're looking for quality people to partner with because you want to be a passive investor. You don't want to be the one picking the real estate deals, picking the properties, owning and operating them. You want to own them passively. So that comes down to picking the right partners. What are some of the most important aspects that you consider when you're evaluating different partners that are trying to raise capital from you? Well, so first off, I think anyone who does passive investing as a limited partner, as an LP, mm-hmm. uh, needs to, like, anyone needs to understand that the deal doesn't mean anything. What matters is the people you invest with. Um, and so the most important aspect is vetting those people, those companies. And for us, it's always been investing with people we know, lowering the risk that they will not lie to us, cheat us, scam us, or screw us over in that sense, right? Just that, that lowers the risk. There's always a risk involved, but lowering the risk means that I want to find people I trust who won't do any of that. That's hard. And early on, the only, the only people we invested with were good friends of ours, or good friends of good friends of ours. That, that, that also results in different type of risks because these people don't tend to be huge operators or sponsors. They don't have 10, 20, 30 years of experience but the most important thing for us is we know that they are going to be 100% trustworthy. Um, that, would, for us, is the, is, is the foremost important aspect for passive investing. And it's hard to find those types of people. Um, and, and after we exhausted or the people we know or friends of friends of people we knew, uh, we started to look other places to find ways to meet people that we can create that high level of trust. And it's not foolproof, but it's it, but, but sort of like, you know, going to these events, joining investor clubs and communities, consuming a lot of content, cross-referencing a lot of information. It's a hard process to find those people. But once they're, once sort of you find them, it just becomes like streamlined. Then it's just a matter, right? You get, you get an email with a deal and it's a spreadsheet or, uh, some sort of offering. It's not a matter of like, is this information correct, legit or not? Because I already vetted the person. I, I trust that what they give me is, is accurate. Now it's just a matter for me is, do the numbers match my strategy at this point in time? Uh, and that sort of, because a lot of people think that passive, that doing that type of investing is not passive. And it's not if you don't have those people you can trust. I've never visited any investment property I've invested in. Never, like, because I don't, I don't. I, I, my passion is building tech companies. I am not. In, I'm not going to be a real estate active investor. I have no aspiration to becoming a general partner at any point. I just want my money to grow with people I trust. That's a, a long answer to to a short but important question. There. No, no, but it's it's a super important question. I think it was a great answer. It's similar to how I might answer as well. I have reviewed. I don't know how many pitch decks over the last several years running my Opportunity Zones business and my alternatives investments business at Wealth Channel now. Uh, and I've also spoken with hundreds of high net worth investors. And, and I get questions, uh, different questions from both sides. But the investors ask me, hey, what should I be looking for in a deal? And I have to tell them the deal is almost secondary. You need to make sure that you trust the person that you're writing a check to. Do you believe in the team? Do you, do you understand and believe the story that they're telling you about who they are and what they're investing in? The deal is important. Don't get me wrong, but it's almost secondary. In fact, I, 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 not even almost. It is secondary to who is running it, what, who is the team behind it. 
And then the other side, you know, I consult with different asset managers and deal sponsors on, you know, how to put together a compelling pitch deck. And sometimes I go through a pitch deck and there's very little information about the team or there's not even photos of the people on the team. I'm like, you got to, you got to tell the story about yourself because before you sell the deal, you're really selling yourself. You're locking up this LP's money for how many years he may not know you yet. That's the first step. You need to make your introduction of yourself to the LP before you ask him or her for any money. It's super important. The people behind the deal sometimes that gets uh, that gets forgotten about, you know. But they they try to lead the investor. I'm sorry, the uh, deal sponsor tries to lead with the deal a little bit too much, I think. And especially when you're first getting to know an investor, it's it's all about you, the person behind the deal. Totally agree. And and I think, uh, yeah, like you, Litan, I don't know that I've visited any of the real estate projects that I've invested in. I'm thinking I, I am invested in in one tech company, and I did visit their their tech camp campus once. Uh, but other than that, I don't know that I've visited any of the uh, the multifamily buildings or or other types of buildings that that I've invested in over the years, because I just trust the folks running it to to do what they do best. I don't need to uh, be visiting the the sites all the time. So uh, you're, in, you're in real estate. Are you are all of your LP investments solely in real estate or do you have any uh, private equity deals outside of real estate? So um, real estate, different types of real estate, mm -hmm. uh, storage as well, um, ATM, Trying to think about others. I think no, mainly, main, but it's mainly real estate. Yeah. It's sort of value add and development. Um, yeah, just to your point, just on the passive and trust, I'll give you an, like a, a very short story, an example of how passive and trustworthy I am when I invest with someone or how important the trust factor is. So we invested with this guy in Brooklyn who, who, who bought a small multifamily, you know, threeplex, I guess, or fourplex. Mm -hmm. with the objective to flip it and do like 30, 35% within a year. That was sort of the plan. And after he bought it, a month goes in and he got an offer to sell it for and make 10% profit. And he called us and asked us, we were like three or four partners. He's like, what do you guys want? What do you guys think I should do? And we're like, dude, we don't know. We, we trust you. You make the call and whatever you decide, we're fine with it. He ended up selling it and we made 10% after a month. We'd, which is fine, right? And again, it's like, all I care about is, is what they think. If they think it's a good deal, if they think it's a good opportunity, then I'm in. If the numbers match what, what sort of we're looking for. So yeah, so totally agree. Yeah, that's maybe the biggest value of being an LP investor is you get to outsource that decision-making to someone that you, that you know and you trust and you value their judgment you don't want to have to think about it. You're running your own company or you're spending time with your family. You don't want to have to think about all these different deals that you're invested in. If they call you and ask you for advice, just say, I don't know, <laughs> you figure it out. Exactly. I'm, uh, I'm playing with my kid or I'm, I'm running my business over here, right? How many different uh, uh, deals are you invested in these days? I think I've done 30 something deals over the years. Um, I think they're like 10 active at the moment or eight, I, I don't remember. Um, but yeah, but to your question before, it's all real estate and mm -hmm. uh, a real estate equivalent. Some startups as well. Nothing more than that. Yeah, all all real estate, but uh, some of the real estate has a has an operating business component on top of it, like the ATM um, has some some uh, revenue or some cash flow generated from, I guess, the operation of of the ATM, um, and then the 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 storage units. There's probably a, a business there at the at the uh, storage facilities. Um, so you said about 30 different deals that you've invested in, 10 active. How many different operators is that with or GPs is that with? Is it is it a smaller group of GPs that you've invested with multiple times or yeah, some and some just win one off so I haven't invested again with. I think over the years we've invested with like 10 or 11 different GPs hmm. across those deals. Um and again, it's not because some of these GPs, because these are small operators, um, they don't tend to have a lot of deals. And so it's not because they they, they raised money and, and and we didn't want to invest, it's just because they didn't have any more deals 
just because they're looking for really good stuff. And because these are small operators, they, they're really picky uh, to what they choose. They don't have a ton of investors. So they don't have to supply deal flow for a lot of investors who are looking to invest. Um, one of the things I've seen with you know, the, the huge operators that send a deal every other week is that they'll have hundreds of different LP investors and they need to supply, supply for that demand. Um, and so there's a lot of deal flow coming in, which personally, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like to invest with those, those types of, uh, outfits. Um, just cause I, I don't want to get deal flow every other week. I think that mm. it's a numbers game and some of these fall and not cause they're bad operators, just cause that's, that's the, that's the game, right? Things, bad things happen. Um, so I prefer to, to invest with more medium to smaller operators that, you know, do one or two deals a year, maybe a little more, just because I feel like that's sort of the smaller operation, not a lot of overhead, really important for them to care for their investors. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the case for investing in, in smaller to medium as opposed to larger. I think I tend to lean toward the the other side of the spectrum. I, I tend to invest with the with the larger companies that might be a little bit more established um but uh you know that there's a different level of risk there that that I'm comfortable with than what you're comfortable with it sounds 100%. like 100% it's it's all yeah totally risk return yeah. um i also spoke with a, a fairly large operator who also gave me a different different insight which is really interesting to think about the bigger operators don't go for the smaller deals smaller deals have a lot of potential also higher risk, right? So the medium to smaller operators go after the smaller deals, which have higher risk to turn. The bigger operators go after the bigger deals because they have to deploy a lot of capital. Yep. So these bigger deals tend to be more relevant for them. So that's also an interesting, interesting aspect. And also I was over, over the years, I was under this sort of misconception that the larger operators have sort of um, worse or not LP, um, uh, a beneficial terms. It's like the small operators, many, many times there's a split and there's only one pref. And then above that, it's like a straight split, like 80-20 you know, yep. uh, towards the LPs. And then I had a conversation with with larger operators over the years where I've even heard like, it's like a 6% pref and then 50-50 on top. And they can afford that because they're huge and they have a lot of LPs and that makes sense. But I prefer the better terms for me, the LP, even, even if it's high risk. But then recently I read some operate, met some operators that have really good terms for LPs and these are bigger operators. I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll reconsider my strategy of, of who to invest with. But yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of interesting aspects to that LP investing lessons that I learned over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 50, 50 split after a 6% pref doesn't sound very good to me. <laughs> I think I've seen, uh, yeah, typically what I see is a uh, six to 8% pref and then 80, 20 is pretty typical. And then sometimes you can get to 50, 50, but only after you achieve a pretty high hurdle, maybe of, of, you know, somewhere in the, the low to mid teens. Uh, but these deals are structured all different ways by all sorts of different operators. And, uh, yeah, I would just encourage LPs to always, always ask about the waterfall terms before they invest, uh, if that matters to you, and it probably should. So you mentioned you're doing uh, almost exclusively real estate, a little bit of operating businesses uh, wrapped into those real estate deals. What locations do you like? Are you primarily uh, in the US or, or do, you, do you do some some stuff closer to, to where you are as well in, in Europe or the Middle East? So I've invested in mainly in the US. I've done a few investments in Europe. Um, I invested... Now I only invest either in euros or dollars. I had one investment that I did in Poland, um, and it was a good investment, but then the, the, the exchange rates killed me. I mean, they, I didn't lose money, but I made substantially less than I expected because of the exchange rates. And then I decided from that moment on, I'm not investing in anything that's on a major currency anymore. Um, but other than that, sort of, I want to diversify into euro and dollars, but I don't really look into geography as much as they do into the operators, right? I think that's, again, that's key. I don't really care where they invest as long as, as, as they're good people to invest with. Yeah. It always comes back to that, right? So you mentioned uh, you, you are no longer doing any deals that aren't on a major currency. Uh, maybe that was a, a mistake that you made uh, picking something in, in Poland. I don't even know what their currency is. I guess they're not on the euro. What are they on? <laughs> No, they're in Zl Zloty. Okay, Zloty. Um, 
Never heard of that, I don't think. But uh, <laughs> suffice it to say, maybe that was a mistake you made. Are there any other mistakes that you've made along the way investing in 30 plus deals or, or yeah. lessons that you've learned? So I think another another aspect, and I don't know how important that is in this this environment where interest rates are so high, but that's the question about refinance and what the terms are when a refinance event occurs. And this is something I didn't ask at the beginning. And then when refi started to occur and each operator dealt with it differently, I started to ask that question going into new, new deals. And what I mean is that when you invest in these cash flowing deals, they're usually based on the invested capital in terms of cash on cash annual returns, right? Let's just say you're supposed to get 7 8%. They say 7 8% annualized or annual cash on cash return, which is distributed, let's say, every quarter. And let's say you invest $100,000. And so 8,000 bucks a year, every quarter, $2,000 makes sense. But then what happens if after two years, there's a refinance event and you get $70,000 back? That's great. But what happens to the remaining? What happens to the cash, the, the distributions? What happens if you hold the property now for another 10 years and, I, and you return all the $100,000 in the refi event? Do I get any cash I'm going? Like, there's a lot of these questions that I never asked at the beginning, and now I ask, not necessarily because of the terms, of, but more as the response of the operator and see how they deal with that type of question. Or if they even know the answer to that question. Exactly. Well, I mean, yeah. it's all right. By the way, it's all right not to know it. I mean, yeah. not everyone asks that question. Yep. But when someone answers it wrong, and I, and I drill down on it, and I want to make sure, are you sure what you're saying? Because it doesn't make any sense. And then they'll go check and go back to your right. I was wrong. It's like it, that, that whole dynamic just helps vetting the person mm. you're investing with. Um, and so that was something that those are good, again, those are good problems to have, right? You invested capital. Let's say you get all the capital back. You're at zero risk, but still you want to admit, you want to understand what's happening with this deal. If that situation occurs, because the first or the second multifamily value add deal I did eight years ago, we got, I messed up hundred thousand. I got exactly that. I got 70,000 back after a year and a half. And I'm still in the deal. They haven't exited yet. The cash flow I'm getting is based on the remaining capital invested. So it's like the IRR on that will be okay because they got a chunk of money at the beginning, but it's still like from a cash flow perspective, like I'd prefer that money to be sitting elsewhere and making more money. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, that's another, another lesson, I guess, that we've learned uh, investing in these types of deals. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. And, and, and that lesson uh, gives you the knowledge that you need to ask some hard questions of, uh, of your GPs and get to figure out how they respond to a tough question like that, whether they know their stuff or not. Uh, what, what are your overall goals wh when it comes to your LP portfolio, your passive real estate portfolio? And, and it, what, what, how, what's your investment strategy to try to attain those goals? So it depends. Uh, that's, that's what comes into the numbers, if the numbers match my strategy. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm investing in a multifamily value add type deal, uh, for me, that's like medium risk. And so medium risk, I expect a, specific, a, a certain return on that risk. And I'll look for you know 12 to 18% IRR on those types of deals. And then if it's a development type of deal, uh, which is higher risk, I'll expect higher returns in shorter terms, shorter time, right? So like a development, if a multifamily deal is like five to 10 years holding period, a development deal should be one to three years max and should generate above 25% IRR in my, in my mind. So that's like a strategy that I look for. Um, uh, and, and, and same goes for like ongoing cash flow. If it's a short-term deal, like two to three years, then cash flow, ongoing cash flow doesn't mean much. But if it's a five to 10 year, I want to see cash flow um, ongoing. So, so those are my strategies for investing. And obviously, I want to be passive, as passive as possible. I want my money to work for me. And I want to spend time with people who matter um, and build companies that I enjoy building. And so that all supports that strategy. And it sounds like you're not just doing more opportunistic, higher risk or development deals. And you're not all, you're also not just doing on the other side of the spectrum, just, just uh, core value add type 
medium risk deals, I guess you're doing a, you're, you're kind of blending your different risks into, into a larger portfolio. Is that right? Yeah. Again, the, 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 the key indicator for me is who am I investing with yep. and then what type of deals they have. I have so many good people I'd want to invest with now. Now it's just a matter of liquidity. Like if I had a lot more liquidity, I'd be able to deploy it tomorrow um, yeah. with my trust. Um, but yeah, so it's, 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 I don't wait for a good deal to come by. I wait for a good uh, um, uh, operator that I want to invest with. That makes sense. Um, what about some of uh, your favorite deals that you've done over the last, well, you've been doing this for about seven or eight years. I think you mentioned any deals that really stick out in your mind. I mean, this type of investing is a little boring. Uh, right? <laughs> I it's think not, that's a good answer. Yeah. It's not, it's not like... Um, yeah, well, this was like there was a lot of adrenaline in this deal and a negotiation. When like I, we, I don't, I don't do that, right? Yeah, I can say that like probably one of the operators I like to invest with. They're like a one-stop shop. They do everything from you know locate the property, raise funding, property manage it as well. So, like they do everything end to end, like a a full turnkey uh, solution, uh, like fully integrated. I guess I think that's that's the the wording for it, right? And and. Mm-hmm. And they're just really good people, communicate really well. And the last deal they exited, and this was a multifamily value add deal, they did 30% IRR. And so, again, that was like an amazing market conditions over the past few years. But that's a deal I remember because it was like outperformed with good people. Um, other than that, that Brooklyn deal was something that I remember, right? Just to prove to myself that I'm passive. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about partners? Or do you... Or, or do you have partners that you oftentimes will invest with other people? Yeah. Maybe so, friends or colleagues that, that you'll kind of go in with them on a deal or they'll pull you into a deal. So my co-founder and I, we invest almost in everything together. Okay. Uh, we, and at some point, I think eight years ago, we established an LLC in the States and we invest through just so we can diversify into more deals, mm-hmm. reach those minimum tickets in each of those deals at the beginning. Right, because like many many of these deals have fifty or hundred thousand k minimum. Mm-hmm. So if you don't want to do that, you have we, we sort of we establish this LLC that we invest through, and then each of us put fifty into a deal that you, the minimum is hundred. Mm. LLC. So we do a lot of investing together, and we have other friends that we've invested with. Um, I joined uh, uh, this mastermind uh, community uh, called Go Abundance um, mm. a few years ago. That I also invest with some guys in that in that group as well. Um, so, yeah, I'd say almost everything I do, I invest with other people that, 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 that either I trust them, they trust me, we invest together. Yeah, that's always nice to be able to do that uh, as opposed to going it alone. My longtime business partner and good friend, Andy Hagens and I, we oftentimes will go in together on a deal. So uh, he, he, he has blind spots and I have blind spots, but we kind of balance each other out. We know where, <laughs> where each other's blind spots are. So it's more fun that way, I think, to go into deals with with a friend of yours um so you can, about, you can celebrate I don't, you, I don't know about you guys but my co-founder my wife always jokes he's like my second wife or first depending on <laughs> and we'll do a, we do a lot, of, a lot of stuff together so. i i know how that is i i spend too much time with my uh my fellow co-founder as well <laughs> to the to the uh to the chagrin of my wife sometimes uh, <laughs> but i digress let's get back on track here um what, what about some of the challenges of being NLP. It, it's kind of difficult to manage, obviously, all the different um, sources of cash flow and and all the different deals you're invested in and the different, um, I don't know what kind of tax returns you get there in Israel. I suppose you 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 do have tax liabilities in the US, so you probably get a lot of the same tax forms that, that I would. Um, but there's a lot of challenges with being a passive LP. Um, in that you start to think, boy, how passive is this really? Can you can you go through what some of those biggest challenges are? And these are first world problems, right? And oh, good, absolutely, absolutely. Good problems to have. So I want to just start with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, over the years, when you when you when you sort of invest in all these different types of of investments, you'll lose track of it. So I get an email from an operator, and I'm like, oh shit, how much I invest with this guy? Uh, when did I? Invest? Is this what I expected? Um, and you know, money going in and out of your bank account and like understanding what, wait, is this, is this $2,000 coming in? Is this what, 
what is this even related to? Is it supposed, what am I supposed to, to happen? And then obviously at the end of the year, you know, tax returns, K-1s, 1099s coming in. It was just a mess, right? And so at some point three years ago, me and my co-founder are like, yeah, this is passive, but it's becoming too active. Um, and no financial advisor or wealth manager around us sort of like could help us. And so we said, screw that, let's just build something for us to, to automate that. And so, yeah, so we, we took those problems we faced as LP investors and built ourselves a piece of software to automate the whole thing for us. Just to automate and, and simplify the process of being an LP to be able to capture all those tax forms, to be able to um, essentially see a dashboard of what's going on in your portfolio. Tell us a little more. What What, what is Visor and who are your users and, and what does it do? Yeah, so that turned into Visor. Like we built this for us and then a bunch okay. of friends wanted it as well. And the ah. whole thing around this was like, I get an email from an operator, just throw it into this platform. And I link in my bank account and automatically detect transactions. And then everything would just be linked together. And then a bunch of friends who were like us wanted it as well. And then we said, wait, there might be a whole business here. Hmm. And so we, we, we sort of spoke with a lot of people around the world, specifically in the US, and just found a lot of people like us. And we decided to build a new startup. And that's what Visor is, basically. And so Visor is this platform that helps people like us that have this more complexity that they're dealing with spreadsheets that break, that get emails and cash flow going in and out and just don't have a solution. So that's what we build Visor for. It sort of automates that whole process of gathering your emails, your documents, linking in your bank accounts, your, and then also brokerage accounts, like everything into one place, projecting cash flow. Um, we, we also have this really cool feature we launched a few weeks ago, which shows our members where other members are investing anonymously like how their asset allocation looks which operators people are investing in. because it's so hard like i said to find people to trust like i've spoken with operators and i've asked them for references to other people who invested with them but i don't even know if they're going to give me legit references right and so we built this whole aspect of the platform to show me anonymously where others are investing and that creates a zero conflict of interest super transparent aspect of private investing um, and there's a lot of stuff we want to add on to that. But the idea is to get that holistic approach. We call it like a, a type of virtual family office for people mm -hmm. that are big enough to have a family office, but they're big enough to have complexity. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so it's not just a tool that LPs can use, but it's also, um, in some way, it's like a community, I guess, although it's it's anonymous, uh, but you, but you kind of get to see what other like-minded investors are doing with with some of their capital I think that's really interesting. Tell me more about um, the, the the mastermind that you're in, also Go Abundance. I mean, you get, kind of getting back to that community aspect because I think that's so important with being an LP is not going it alone. If you have a, a partner or a co-founder like you do or and I have to to go in on deals together, that's that's really neat. But it's always kind of good to uh, move with the the crowds or kind of gain wisdom from crowds and and at least different people in your network or different like minded investors. What what do you get out of that? mastermind that that you're a part of yeah so there but we found there are a bunch of these types of mastermind groups uh mm -hmm. some of them are free some of them cost money go abundance um has this minimum net worth and, and it costs some money and it's a group of, of just people that are like-minded to sort of build wealth powerful relationships spend time like go on a great experiences together and also invest together um and there also tend to be a lot of real estate people in that group as well but a bunch of another group. There's, a, there's another group called Left Field Investors. Um, I've seen them, yeah. yeah. So so Jim, one of the founders there, and, and he's, he's a good friend and, and they're doing some really cool stuff as well. And a bunch of these online communities. I think you also have one, right? For um, for uh, investors that are interested in, in opportunity zones and stuff like that, right? Yeah, well, it's not a mastermind group, but we do have a, a large platform and, and email list and we do multiple online events per year. Uh, through Opportunity DB, we have our OZ Pitch Day events where our group of investors come to learn about qualified opportunity funds that are raising equity from high net worth investors. So similar, yeah, but I wouldn't say it's exactly a mastermind group. But yeah, there's a, there there are some similarities there for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think these places just a way to connect with people that are like minded, mm -hmm. that are looking to create like build strong relationships and build more wealth. Um, so it's, it's, it's powerful. 
And then um, you were struggling with all of the different tax forms and managing your portfolio across a dozen or more, a couple, a few dozen different deals. So you you started this thing that eventually turned into Visor, and now Visor's up and running. Um, who should join Visor, and why? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think that that once you reach a level of complexity, uh, and what that means is when you have at least five plus private investments, um, that's when things become a little complicated and you have to build spreadsheets that break. In addition to a budgeting app that you might use like Mint or Personal Capital, all these other budgeting apps out there, you still need to start to maintain a, a, a a spreadsheet, and then you have to build a Dropbox or Google Drive folder to get all your documents into and track everything. And if this is not your full-time job, it becomes just a lot of work. And that's when you start to need a platform like Pfizer to help you streamline that, streamline that, not miss stuff, like be very efficient when it comes to taxes, staying on top of your like cash flow. Um, one of the things sort of a lot of people around us sort of joke about is that they might have wealth, but they're cash poor. And then when something occurs, like a cash event or taxes, and they're not ready for it, they have to go scramble for like a line of credit. And so when you're sort of in that wealth creation mode, you need to stay on top of things or else you you might sort of find yourself with your pants down. Um, And so that's sort of like where advisor is to help. Yeah, that's really important because sometimes April rolls around and you've got a tax liability and you realize, I don't have the liquidity to cover this. That could be a huge problem. So advisor helps kind of stay on top of that as well and helps you plan for that. Uh, Lee Tan, this has been really fascinating talking with you today and appreciate all the knowledge and, and insights that you've shared with uh, my listeners and me. Um, you know, you, 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 you're clearly a, a, a pretty savvy, sophisticated LP investor. Um, just to kind of zoom out a little bit and keeping in mind your strategy and, and your goals and, and your experience in being a passive investor, what are some important trends that you see playing out over the next few years across the private equity real estate industry? Or do you not really concern yourself with such things? Do you just really rely on on your relationships and, and the operators and GPs that you trust? You can take that answer in either direction. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the answer is yes, I trust the people I invest with. But the numbers need to match and there's a new strategy and it needs to match because the world is changing. Mm-hmm. And both from a currency's perspective, from an interest rate perspective, um, from a uh, 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 real estate valuation perspective, there's so many things that are changing now. And so the assumptions need to be super, super conservative in my mind when I go into deals today, as opposed to how they were last year. It's very hard to find good deals. It's very hard to raise money. It's very hard to get cheap debt. And I'm not saying it's not possible. There are good deals out there. There are different things that make sense. Um, it still makes sense for the money to be deployed. But on the other hand, there are other opportunities now you know, to make, to get yield at zero risk. In a sense, right? SVB reminded us that there is no zero risk for sure, right? But, the, but at lower risk, right? So like if in Israel, for example, I get 6.5% yield on a monthly dollar cash deposit. 6.5%. That's like at, at zero risk or almost close to zero. Right. And so deals need to be like extremely good on paper and conservative in order to make sense because you have liquidity with, these, with this type of investment, right? Um, you're backed by the government. Uh, and, and so I'm not saying, again, I, I think people should invest. I just think people should, you know, good people be conservative and pay attention to, to, to like what's happening in the markets. Well said. Well said. Uh, well, hey, really want to thank you for joining me today, Leeton. It's been great talking with you. Before we go, where can our audience of high net worth investors go to learn more about you and Visor? If they're interested in, in creating an account advisor or, or learning a little bit more about your platform, where can they go to learn more? Yeah, for sure. So it's visor is v y z e r dot co. It's a weird URL, but that that's it. That that that's it. And you can reach out to me, Litan Advisor, or Twitter, Litan Yaha, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm pretty uh, responsive and happy to 
connect with other LP investors, share more knowledge if anyone's interested. And I really appreciate this, Jimmy. This has been awesome. Um, I love what you guys are doing. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And for our listeners, uh, we will have show notes available at our website, opportunitydb.com slash podcast. And I'll make sure to link to Litan's email address as well as visor. Dot co And please also be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast listening platform to always get the latest episodes. Litan, thanks again for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Sure.